Hi friends, this episode of Big Blue Banter is brought to you by Prize Picks. Head on over to Prize Picks and use promo code BANTER and they'll match up to $100 on a new deposit. Thank you and enjoy. Welcome back. It's the Big Blue Banter, New York Giants football podcast. I'm Dan Schneier. Joined as always my co-host Nick Filato. And today we've got a special guest on, a reoccurring guest. He comes here every year to talk draft with us and we are lucky to have him. And it's Trevor Sikkim of the lead draft analyst now for Pro Football Focus. That's a new title. I like it. And if you've checked out the Pro Football Focus draft guy, which I'm sure you have, that's him on the analysis. So that's definitely something you want to check out. And then I think, you know, a lot of people ask us during draft season or before draft season, like, I want more draft content from a podcast standpoint where can i find it who do you guys suggest and i would say top of my list for people i suggest is trevor and his podcast the nfl stock exchange and he's the co-host of that pod so thank you so much for joining us today trevor and how's the grind going man i'm sure it's busy season for you dude i appreciate it i love coming on the show with you guys getting to chop it up this is always great and yeah draft guide stuff it's coming on great if there's anything in there that people like it was all me if they read something that they don't like yeah. obviously i had nothing to do with it it was somebody else it was outside of my control but no it's great to be on with you guys i'm excited to chat giants football with you excellent trevor we love having you so as any nfl fan base we can be a bit insular right and it could be difficult at times for us to broaden our horizons and see the nfl from a thirty thousand foot view since you cover the broader nfl and college football what is your outside assessment of joe shane and the giants current operational management i like what they're doing i really do and and i i i like a lot more than i don't like is probably the way to say this and i know it's been a roller coaster ride over the last two years you know you had Brian Dable comes in, it's a double digit win season. You make the playoffs, you know, that you're kind of this surprising team where everything really it came together very well on both sides of the ball. Not that it was perfect, but man, it felt like that rebuild, that new regime, everything, all that new life that was infused into the team, it was going in the right direction. Obviously, then you have last year, which doesn't go so well. You know, I, I just feel as though the things that kind of timing and chemistry that went really well for them the year before a little luck, certainly with injuries as well, really came back to bite them this year. And, you know, it didn't, I think the change things obviously changed in how that regime saw the locker room, certainly how they saw part of the coaching staff as well. So you make changes there and you hope that year three for this regime is more towards that first year and everything that was great about that than it was the previous, but They've got some things to work out. I've liked a lot of the moves that they've made in free agency. They obviously have a really good chance to continue to supplement a lot of their roster needs going into the draft. I think they did a great job giving themselves maximum flexibility with that sixth overall pick. And so I I do, I I like Joe Shane. I I like how he approaches team building and things like that. I, I remember, you know, just like being around his combine pressures over the last couple of years. And it's just the way that he, evaluates team play and the emphasis that he has in the trenches, you know, building with the guys up front. I, I feel as though like he just has a really good approach to how you're supposed to build the roster. And sometimes it just doesn't work out. Right. I mean, like sometimes you take swings and misses on guys, whether it's free agency or the draft, but just from hearing him talk, I, I want to continue to believe in this guy. So I am hopeful that this upcoming season for the giants is another good one. I always say that when I'm evaluating these guys running the front offices, I'm just always looking for process. I'm not looking for results. And that's weird to say. And fans are like, what do you mean by that? And it's like, the results are hard to predict. It's the NFL. The draft is a crapshoot. There's a lot of factors, injuries that are out of these guys' control. But as right. long as your process is good, and I think Joe Shane's process has been great, really. Not even just good, great. From a trade standpoint, from an asset management standpoint, results haven't been great yet, but that's going to happen. But the process has to be there. And when the process isn't there, which the Giants have had in the past, you're really in a tough spot. But I want to get down to the nitty-gritty with you quick here. Or not quick, but right away here, Trevor, because it's interesting. Last year when we talked with you, the Giants were picking all the way at 25. And it was very hard to predict where they were going to go in the draft. We kind of, Nick and I kind of had a feeling it was going to be wide receiver or corner, but when you're picking that late in a, in a first round, it could really be anything if there's value there on the board. I mean, the Ravens proved that with Kyle Hamilton a couple years ago, but this year it very much so seems different. It seems singular. It seems like the giants in round one are going to take a wide receiver or a quarterback. And I say that because though Joel Alt is a possibility, he's a great prospect. It seems like based on their free agency moves and the recent investment in Neil, it just doesn't seem likely. So I want to start with quarterbacks. I think I saw this last night and then I was thinking about you because I knew we were doing the pods today, Trevor. But I think you responded to a tweet from Brett Coleman, who was like, 
I just don't understand how Drake may is not quarterback two in this draft. It's wild to me. And I don't understand it at all. And then I think you responded with something similar. Like uh, you might've been the one who said like in any other class, he might be quarterback one. I want to get your evaluation on if that's true, if you view may as the quarterback two in this class and why maybe you see it differently than some of the analysts who have kind of uh, looked into some of the negatives a little bit more and, and what you like about May. Yeah. It's been both fascinating and frustrating to kind of, you know, see people, get into draft season. Cause I, I also, I, I'm, I'm self-aware enough to know that being the lead draft analyst, I've been doing this since the summer. Like I, I've been mm -hmm. talking about these guys. I've been watching their tape. I watched their 2022 tape. I watched your 2023 tape live. I'm doing more tape evaluation for them when it comes to the draft guide. I'm looking into more of the final metrics. You go through all-star games, you know, like things like that. So I've been doing this for eight to 10 months on these specific players. There's a lot of really smart football people who don't really get to turn the page until January, February. And so right. that's right around the time that I felt like the narrative really started to shake up. Because if you go back to November, it was not really a debate between who were the top two quarterbacks in the class. It was Caleb Williams and Drake May. And in fact, the question was like, okay, well, who's actually QB1? I wasn't the one who said what you had referenced about Drake being QB1 in other classes, but I kind of like understand it. I, I always felt like it was Caleb Williams and then Drake May, but I knew that there were other people who kind of felt that it could have been Drake May as QB1. And we were really just having a discussion of how high are you putting Jaden Daniels? Like, where is Jaden Daniels in this mix? And it was kind of a, right around November was the, ooh, is it spicy to put him in the first round? Like, I'm going to like dabble and, and do this for the mock draft. And then it obviously became a lot more standard as that year finalized, the regular season finalized, he ends up winning the Heisman Trophy, all that. So now we're like, okay, well, he's going to be a first-round pick. And then right around the timeline of January, February, then all of a sudden it was like, no, Jaden Daniels might be QB2. And I was like, whoa, 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 really? Like a lot of people in the league think that? And a lot of people who were kind of turning the page getting towards draft season around that time of year, I was like, wow, a lot of people really think this, really? And I went back to watch another round of tape for these guys for the draft guide. And it was right around that time that Jaden Daniels was kind of getting this might be QB two hype. And so it was a good time for me to go back over some film to say like, did I miss something here? Do, do, is this guy really QB two in this class? And I don't mean to take anything away from the year that Jaden Daniels had last year. I think that it was phenomenal. If you just look at 2023, Jaden Daniels very clearly had the best year of any of those quarterbacks, yeah. but pro projections, I came away. Very clear, Caleb Williams is my QB1. Very clear, Drake May is my QB2. And then you kind of start to have a conversation, Drake May, J.J. McCarthy. There's certain things that McCarthy does well, that J.J. doesn't, and vice versa. So to me, the conversation starts there. And what I love about Drake is a lot of experience attacking over the intermediate middle, mm -hmm. middle which I think is very, very important. 10 to 20 yards down the field in between the numbers. You got to be able to be comfortable, confident, and willing to fire in those tight window throws to really make sure that you're keeping defense is honest. Because if not, if you're only a sideline thrower, which some of the guys in this class are, all of a sudden defenses, safeties can creep a little bit more towards the hashes, towards yeah. the sideline before the snap. Linebackers can do the same. If they know that you are afraid to attack over the middle, you're not even going to look over the middle. They're, you're not going to keep them honest. And, and you're going to let them cheat a little bit in, their, in, in, in where they're dropping and where they're going. And when you do that against NFL defender athletes, it's not a good case if you're the quarterback. So I love that about Drake. I also think that Drake just clearly has an NFL arm. Like I think, yeah. I think that it's well above adequacy for the NFL level, especially when it comes to velocity. And I, I, I understand the critiques of Drake may, right? Like some people talk about, well, the fundamentals aren't as clean as they are for some of these other prospects. Sometimes he just misses some throws and he does, you know, people look at it and they're well, he didn't really have a signature game. He didn't really have like a takeover performance that I can point to. And I get it. It's not like any of that stuff is wrong. Mm -hmm. But for you to say, well, I'm not going to take him as a second quarterback in this class because of that. That's right. where I'm like, all right, I think we're nitpicking a little bit here. <laughs> You're talking about a two-year junior starter who's still young and who still has a lot of really great football ahead of him, can clean up those fundamentals, can get even better. He's got one hell of a, a, an athletic family. I mean, his, his brother played basketball at UNC. He was a star there. His brother was a pitcher for the national championship team at Florida. His dad played sports as well. Like every single 
family member of the May family has been like extremely athletic. You know that that competitive nature runs deep within him to be the best quarterback that he could be. I've had the chance to sit down and get to talk with Drake. It was over a year ago, but I loved our time that, that we that we had just chatting about life, chatting about ball. I did a feature article on him. And so it's like, nice. I, I don't know. I, I don't really know how we're getting to this point. <laughs> you could critique Drake. That's uh, totally fine. And I, and I see a lot of what people are talking about. Yes. But to take him off the QB2 spot because of those things, I think we're getting a little carried away and a little too nitpicky. That's me personally. And I'm okay with some of the criticism when it has to do more with how it, how he projects the NFL, but it's the stuff about like how he did in college and and that type of criticism. I just like I find a hard time taking seriously because like oh he didn't he plays in the ACC and he lost this game to this team and I'm like dude like this quarterback is the biggest projection position of all these positions and it's almost all projection it feels like to me and so I'm more focused on the things you're talking about that can't be taught the arm talent, the willingness to throw over the middle, especially mm -hmm. in the NFL. Like it's different in college. Like when you watch LSU, a lot of what they do to me, at least, and you can tell me if I'm wrong, and this is not a knock on Jaden because it doesn't mean he can't do it at the NFL level, but a lot of what they do is taking advantage of the space due to the rules of college football. Mm -hmm. And that's okay. And that's a lot of what Hendon Hooker in Tennessee does. And it's fine. It works in college football, but these rules are different in the NFL. And more importantly, like you said, the speed of the safeties and the speed of the secondary is so different that you don't always have those outside that you need to be able to drive on time, the intermediate throws that you're talking about in the middle of the field. And it's just like, these are things that can't be taught to me. Um, so, you know, it's interesting just to hear the criticisms and, and I'm with you on May. Obviously, I've made it clear he's my QB2 and a player I would love the Giants to get. Trevor, speaking about projecting quarterbacks forward to the NFL, J.J. McCarthy has been linked to the New York Giants through the rumor mill. So I just wanted to get your assessment yeah. of J.J. McCarthy's projection to the NFL. I like J.J. I didn't think we'd be talking about him as a top 10 pick. You know, like I gave him a late first, early second round grade when it comes to film, but like there are a lot of things to like about him. And and there is genuine reason to believe that he can be a good starter at the NFL level. I, I, I hate saying like, Oh, he'll be an all pro. He'll be a pro bowl or things like, cause it, it's so hard in the NFL. And basically what I, what I like to categorize these guys is like, do I think that you could be a legitimate starter? Yes, I think the rest of it's probably up to you. What's the talent ceiling? How do you develop the team around you, the offensive coordinator, the offensive line? Like some of the stuff will go into those awards that you get. But are you a guy that teams feel good about being a starter? And I think that J.J. McCarthy can get to that level. I really do. During the summer, with him being draft eligible, I went back and I watched his 2022 tape. Hated it. To the point where I was like, don't talk to me about this dude as an NFL prospect. Honestly. Mm -hmm. I mean – the pocket presence was not what it needed to be. He did not have a good feel for pressure. He didn't have those eyes in the back of his head, if you will, that you need to be able to have to navigate a pocket correctly, not just at a high level of college football, but also in the NFL. I thought he didn't really recognize things the way that he needed to pre-snap, thought he was fooled post-snap, thought he was late to get to some of his reads. Sure, there were some nice throws that he had in 2022, but the act of playing quarterback in its totality, he just he did not have a good feel for it. 2023, I would argue all of those things got better. Now, not like exponentially, like this dude's a, a, a Hall of Famer in waiting, but to say, okay, here's where you struggled last year. You're still one of the youngest prospects in this class, and you got better at all of that stuff. There's reason to believe you can continue to improve when you have the right coaching, when you have the right system, and most importantly, if he remains confident throughout his rookie year, his mm -hmm. sophomore year, all that kinds of stuff in the NFL, because I think it's an underrated part of quarterback development and just player development in general is, are you confident of a player? Are you second guessing yourself or do you really believe in yourself? Because that will take you from, okay, I failed and now I'm going to get better to, okay, I failed and I'm going to continue to fail if you don't have that confidence. So as long as you can tell me that he's in a situation where, where McCarthy's going to have that confidence, I think he can grow into a really nice quarterback. We talked about throwing over the middle. JJ McCarthy is one of the best in this class of throwing over the middle. You look at his heat map, 10 to 20 yards in between the numbers, boom, it's red. He does not have a fear of doing it, whether it's on play action or not. That's where the offense is going. They like to attack over the middle because they know what it can do for the rest of the passing scheme and for the running scheme as well. It's very, very important, and he's got a lot of experience doing it. Something else that I like about J.J. McCarthy, third and long. He statistically was the best quarterback in this class at that. If you just look at third and long, PFF passing grades, it's like him and Bo Nix are right there. Nix has a little bit higher of a grade than him, but we've got some stats that kind of show 
like a, a you can you can categorize it a little bit better where you've got a long third down situation how often are you throwing short of the sticks and letting a playmaker make a play versus you passing it beyond the first down and going to get it with your arm nicks had more first downs than jj mccarthy did on those third and long situations and he had the better pff passing grade but he threw short of the sticks more than 50 percent of the time Meanwhile, J.J. McCarthy is throwing past the sticks about 65% of the time. So that's something where it's like, okay, do I want to fault Knicks for that because he's making the right play? No, but you feel good about McCarthy being able to do it because he's not afraid to go and get that third down with his arm. And that's something that you love with the mentality of a quarterback as well. So you throw in a little bit of added mobility. I think that if he can gain some weight, he can get even stronger. You need him a little bit more durable, but I like what McCarthy brings to the table. You know, talking about him as a top 10 pick, it's a little bit rich, but it kind of is what it is. When you need a quarterback, you're just yeah. trying to look at any guy that's going to be able to elevate your game and become a potential starter. So in that sense, he fits the bill. But those are my overall thoughts on J.J. McCarthy. What's going on, Big Blue Banter listeners? I'm excited for the football season for several reasons. And one of those reasons is Prize Picks, which is North America's largest independently owned daily fantasy sports platform. And it's so simple to use. Instead of battling thousands of other players, including professionals, sharks, and people who are going to exploit you, you pick more than or less than on two to six player stat projections, and you just watch the winnings roll in. It's very simple to play and gives you a little extra skin. I've set my picks in less than 60 seconds. There are so many stats to choose from, and the withdrawals of funds are easy and quick. Dan and I will be adding a segment to our show before every game where we pick our favorite stats, more or less, yards or touchdowns, what have you, and we'll be discussing why from a scheme, matchup, and game theory perspective. I love their promotions and how easy their interface is to operate at prize picks. I may select more on tackles for a loss from Bobby Okereke or Kayvon Thibodeau next game. They also do other sports as well. It's a really cool experience. Please join Dan and I in the fun of prize picks. Go to prizepicks.com slash banter and use code banter for a first deposit match up to $100. Again, go to prizepicks.com slash banter and use code banter for a first deposit match up to $100. You will not regret it. You ever feel sluggish or out of focus? Are you stressed? Has your digestive system caused discomfort or flatulence like a certain co-host on this podcast during a live stream? If so, you should check out AG1. When I started drinking AG1 daily, I could feel a real difference in my daily health. I had more energy, I was better off at the gym, and I could focus on my work in a much more efficient manner. That's because AG1 is a foundational nutrition supplement that supports your body's universal needs like gut optimization, stress management, and immune support. Since 2010, AG1 has led the future of foundational nutrition continuously refining their formula to create a smarter, better way to elevate your baseline health. Not only did I replace my multivitamin with AG1, but I love that every scoop also includes prebiotics, probiotics, and digestive enzymes for gut support. I recommend AG1 to all my family and friends because AG1 has a team of doctors and scientists that formulate around the latest science and maintains high quality standards within the industry. Even my friends have started drinking AG1, and they always tell me how energetic they feel and how it's helped them out at the gym, and also it's helped them manage their stress levels. If you want to take ownership of your health, it starts with AG1. Try AG1 and get a free one-year supply of vitamin D3, K2, and five free AG1 travel packs when you first subscribe. Go to drinkag1.com banter. That's drinkag1.com slash banter to check it out. 
Well, it's interesting that you mentioned that before we move past him in that sense, he fits the bill. I wonder if that it that sense is the sense you want to be going for as an NFL franchise. That's a whole nother debate. But like it almost leads me to kind of where the Giants made their decision on Daniel Jones. Like, can he be a starter? I'm if I'm using top really, if I'm using any pick on a quarterback, I want him. I want to at least think that he can evolve into a top five or top ten guy, because right. once you pay these guys 50 million a year against the cap, they basically have to be if you want to compete in the NFL. But that's interesting. And that's another debate. I want to hear your thoughts on some of the other quarterbacks though and and you can you can touch on them briefly or go into detail about them but i want to hear your thoughts on caleb williams michael Penix, bo Nix, spencer rattler to be to be specific sure yeah no i'll just fire off some thoughts on him i I like caleb a lot man i think that um caleb gets a lot of unnecessary crap for playing on a usc team that had absolutely no defense behind them that was giving up 50 50 plus points a game and also for a lincoln riley offense i think that people when they look at caleb They think, oh, he's playing in a gimmicky offense. It's built to just pad the stats. Um, And it's just not true. I I mean, I I guess it kind of is. I mean, Lincoln Riley's offense is a produced some Heisman Trophy winner. So, I mean, it's a good offense for college football. But I going back and watching him, I think how he processes and goes through his his reads, his progressions, how he sees the defense, it is underrated at this point. Like, we, Mm -hmm. we don't talk about that enough, how good of a processor Caleb Williams is. He just doesn't do it as much as you know, these other guys who are in these different style offenses because a lot of things are very straightforward with what Lincoln Riley wants you to do. But, man, I think when he when the play called for him to sit in the pocket in between the tackle, scan the field, and, and process what was in front of him, he did that very, very, very well. So I'm not really worried about Caleb Williams. I think he has all the tools to be a pro. It just kind of depends on what spot he's going to go to, what are they going to ask from him, how he's going to improve early on. Nick's. I feel like I'm a little bit higher on Knicks than most people. Now, some have kind of like come around and I feel like there's, there's a little bit of a Bo Nix hive, but I, look, his, his system at Oregon, you're right. It was a pretty straightforward system. It wasn't something that was very high demanding of him, but at the same time, he had a fantastic grade under pressure. He was always cool, calm and collected. He knew where to go with the ball. He knew where his checks were. He knew when to throw away. He never put the ball in harm's way. He always had the offense on time, Mm -hmm. on script, doing what they needed to do. And there were times when they called a play and he needed to rip a throw to the sideline or over the middle, and he could do it 30, 40 yards down the field. I think he's got a legit arm, and I don't think people are giving him enough credit for that. So he's a lot better under pressure than he certainly was in the Auburn days when I didn't think he was a draftable quarterback. He gives you that added mobility. I wish his footwork was a little bit better because that's a reason for, I think, some of the accuracy issues that he does have. He's got a great adjusted completion percentage, but when you see that ball placement issues, I think it's because his footwork is not married up with his throwing motion as well as it could be or consistently as it could be. But I do think that Bo Nix is a good football player. Again, a guy I would draft back into the first round, early part of the second round. Michael Penix. Before we move on past Nix, actually, I I want to go ahead. question for you on Nix. So you said back into the first round, uh, second round i think at that point you're you're hoping that there's a chance maybe he can evolve into a top five top ten but you at least feel like he can be a starter that can keep an offense on rhythm so my question Mm -hmm. for that is this is just my thoughts on Knicks. i i find him to be a really interesting prospect and hard to evaluate from what i've seen because there are some and there are some aspects of the game that people don't give him credit for that i think are interesting like i think he makes some off-platform throws and changes trajectory on the football in interesting ways and i'm like damn this dude has some arm talent but my whole question with him is just all projection based. So like I see the stats and I know the stats are good, especially, and I've, and I've read through the guide. So I see how he's done um, under pre- all the advanced stats and, and raw stats are really good for Bo Nix. And he does keep that Oregon offense on time and on schedule. He does a great job of that better than a lot of these quarterbacks I've watched. Mm-hmm. But my whole thought is like, will he be able to keep an NFL offense on schedule and on time? Like, does that work? Does what he did? Like, cause he'll never be in that system that he played in Oregon in the NFL. Right. And he's never going to have that kind of talent difference to the NFL, unless he gets like a Brock Purdy type situation. Which right. Is hard to build around him. But like when, from a projection standpoint, do you see him as a quarterback who can keep an offense on time and in rhythm based on his skill set? I do. I really do. Okay. Now, I, I know I'm, I'm about to name like three head coaches that every coach would, or that every quarterback would love yeah. to play for. But like, if you put, Nick's with Shanahan. I think he's great. Mm -hmm. If you put him with McVay, I think like, I love the idea of maybe not at 19 because I think the Rams need a good football, a a really good starter at 19, but like somehow, some way if Bo Nix gets on the the Rams and he's backing up Matthew Stafford, like I love that. That's amazing. Stafford plays for the rest of this year. Maybe he plays the year after that, but maybe not. And this Nick's can take over and he's in a system where I think 
He could be a great facilitator and he could give you the kind of throws that you want. I mean, I, I feel that Nix is, he's not the same type of quarterback, but like, to me, he's like a Jared Goff type. And I know some people look at Jared Goff and they kind of roll their eyes, but look at what Goff has been able to do when he gets in that right system, right? He's able to keep it on schedule on time. This True. is a team that almost made the Super Bowl, right? Are you taking Jared Goff over like the Justin Herberts, the Lamar Jacksons, the Josh Allens? No, of course you're not. But this is somebody who can clearly win in this league, has the ability to do it. That's kind of how I see Knicks. So that's okay. that's my evaluation of that. Nice. I like it. Okay, you're going on to Penix. We want more on that. Yeah, so Penix, how it's serving our man. I mean, I think that even with Joe Milton included, like you could say that Penix has the best arm in the class because Joe wow. Milton is just not accurate enough. And I, I know that Joe Milton could throw it at a country mile, but he's just not well, let accurate me, Let me just enough. cut you off real quick there just to ask you a question. When you say best yes. arm in the class, are you referring to like just pure arm strength or arm talent? Because I, I would, I'm just, is that comparing with Williams as well, Caleb as well? Yeah, so okay. I, I would say, so like the the way that I'm saying Penix has the best arm in the class is essentially both distance and velocity. Okay. Accuracies, I'm not exactly counting okay. accuracy. Ball placement, you're taking out, stuff like we'll that. We'll get into that in a second. But yeah, like arm strength, okay? Mm -hmm. Maybe not like overall arm talent if you want to throw in gotcha. touch and ball placement and things like yep. that. Arm strength. I mean, like this dude can absolutely rip a throw anywhere. They didn't really ask him to throw over the middle a lot, but mm -hmm. a lot of stuff was to the outside, outside the numbers, and it was just a vertical offense that was perfect for what he was bringing to the table. Um, the thing that worries me a little bit about Penix is his passing grade under pressure is bad. Uh, he's just not an outside of structure type of passer. Uh, he's got more mobility than I think people give him credit for, but even with that being the case, He's very comfortable in between the tackles. That's where he does his best work. If you move him off platform, the passing efficiency and the passing grades really drop. So I'm a little bit worried about that because in today's day and age, you're looking for athletes at the quarterback position as well. And so when you're not one of those, it, you just really, really have to be pinpoint when you're in the pocket. And sometimes Penix is, but even the accuracy scores are good with him. I do worry about the overall ball placement because when he's not throwing a fastball, when he has to put some extra air on it, when it's more of a timing thing, when it's more of a touch thing, the ball placement, I think, eludes him at times. And so I, I, I Penix is the biggest wild card in this class to me because mm -hmm. if you told me five years from now, uh, he's made the Pro Bowl twice and he's he's a like easy starter in this league, really make us a noise, it'd be like, yeah, he's got the arm talent to do it, absolutely. But if you told me that his accuracy issues – three, four years into his rookie contract. Now, all of a sudden, like he's probably on his second team. I can believe that too. So he is a total variance wild card for me. I see the talent. I just wanted to see a little bit more consistency from him, from that pinpoint NFL level type of accuracy and ball placement, touch, things like that. Um, Rattler's, Rattler's the last one that you mentioned. And I like Spencer Rattler, man. I think that he's actually pretty close to those groups of quarterbacks that, uh, that I mentioned there. I think the NFL's, feels the same from everything that I heard. Rattler's not the same quarterback that he was at Oklahoma. You know, it's really hard for people to get over first impressions. Right. And I think the QB one documentary and all the wild throws that he was making in, at Oklahoma. I mean, that just has not been who he has been or who he is today. I've had the chance to get to talk with him a couple of times and, and he's just a much more mature put together evolved it feels like human being than he was when he came into the spotlight uh, out of high school and into that Oklahoma offense and I think that his game reflects that man this is somebody who shows a really great feel for the pocket despite being pressured on almost 40 percent of his dropbacks yeah. this past year insane Crazy. I mean he played behind one of the worst power five offensive lines no question about it in the SEC he, in the SEC without juice wells like he, <laughs> the only guy he had to throw to was xavier leggett who had a fantastic year i don't want to take anything away from him but like leggett was also a barely draftable wide receiver right. before this year and that was his that was his without question wide receiver one this past year they lose marshawn lloyd out of the backfield because lloyd transfers from south carolina right. to usc like everything felt like it went wrong for spencer this year but he played pretty well. You never saw him throw his teammates under the bus. You never saw him yelling at dudes. You never saw him like bring out the ego or anything like that. And I feel like in fact, it was the opposite. He had a lot of trials, a lot of fire, and he was able to show how much of a leader he was this past year. So you throw in the arm talent, 
which I think is pretty dang good with Spencer Rattler as well. And then just that enhanced maturity with him. He's not going to be a first round pick, but he is somebody that uh, I don't often say this because sometimes it feels like you're either a first round pick quarterback or I, I'm, I'm drafting in like the fourth round. Like you're just yeah, going to be yeah. a backup. It's not a big deal. I don't really have this gray area very often, but I think I like that, that. Spencer Rattler is in a little bit of this gray area where you take a chance on him in day two and see what happens. A lot of quarterback talk here, Trevor, but before we get you out of here, we want to be cognizant of your time. We have to ask you about a wide receiver dilemma that the giants are in right now, because Mm. we here on the big blue banter podcast, we believe the giants are going to go wide receiver if they don't go quarterback and the two wide receivers that we're talking about are Roma Dunze and Malik neighbor. So can you tell our audience what your opinions are on those two. And maybe even if you have an opinion on which one would fit a Brian Dable offense, even better, please feel free. Wow. So you guys just really don't like Marvin Harrison jr. Huh? You wouldn't take it. Not at all. Not at all. (laughs) No. So look, these two guys are fantastic. I've said this throughout the draft process in most other years. One of these guys is wide receiver one, right? And they just happen to not only to be a, be in a class with each other, but be in a class with Marvin Harrison jr. As well. We have three, legitimate wide receiver one for a draft class candidates here in one singular class. So it's pretty special. I think all these guys are going to go out out in the top 10 because of it. I have neighbors as my wide receiver too, simply because the way that neighbors is able to move specifically the way that he is able to change direction while either maintaining his speed or even getting faster is pretty dang rare, even for a player who's, not the biggest wide receiver in the world, but like I've said this before, I I hate giving like super lofty comps for these guys are so talented. He reminds me a little bit of how Antonio Brown won when Antonio Brown was just cooking everyone in the league every single week. It was because he was able to flip his hips, change direction and yet still maintain or increase speed to where even if the corner was anticipating it well enough, chances are he's already moving too fast. It doesn't matter. He already created the throwing window. And so I've, I saw that so many times with Malik Neighbors this past season. I think he needs to get up a little bit stronger. He's got to get stronger getting off press because he's winning a lot with quickness and speed off of press right now. He's got to get stronger getting off press. And he's got to get stronger at the catch point. But if he does those things, the quickness and the movement skills are just rare. They truly are. And then Adunze, everything I've heard about Adunze is that he is killing every interview that he is in. Yep. Like that every single team loves this dude, 6'3", 215. I mean, he's a phenomenal athlete for his size. And I'll tell you this too, again, going back to summer scouting, I wasn't the biggest Romo Dunes a fan because I went, okay, I see you. You're a better route runner and a better mover than guys who normally are of your size. But I was like, you still got to be able to go up and get those contested catches, right? I don't want you to just be a big bodied receiver who can move, right? I want you to be a big bodied receiver who is a big body dude and can yeah. move. Like I need you to be both of those things. I don't want to take away one for the other. I want you to be the best of both worlds. And in 2022, his contested catch percentage and just I felt like his strength at the catch point was not what I thought that it was going to be and I was disappointed. This past year, I, he was the best contested catch wide receiver in football. I know people like to bring up Keon Coleman cuz Keon Coleman was great as well, but when you look at the statistics <laughs> Romo Dunze caught more than 70% of his contested Crazy. catches. He caught 17 of his 24 contested catches. It's so hard a, to do. Dude's a monster. And we're yeah. talking, and 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 this is Washington's offense too, right? You're right. not just, it's not just like contact on a slant route. You yes. know, like we're, we're talking about, you are, you are 20, 30, 40 yards down the field. You are fighting for that thing in the right. air and he's coming down with it. So that combination, man, I think is fantastic. I, I wonder given Shane and Dable's emphasis towards the trenches and strength, I wonder if that ends up with them leaning more towards Odunze um, instead of Malik neighbors. Cause they have some, they have some quicker fast. They've got some speed elements on the team already, right? Like I'm not saying that Wanda Robinson or Jalen Hyatt are Malik neighbors. They're not, but you can convince yourself, Hey, we've got the speed elements on this team. We can kind of make it work. If both are available at number six, I I, I kind of feel like they would lean Rome. Yeah, I think based on what you said too, one factor is him him killing the interviews. That's a big one for Joe Shane and and Brian Dable. They're big on can these receivers think and can they? And I'm not saying Malik Neighbors not one of those guys. I don't know, but 
you know, the offense, we've had issues with Gary's Tony running wrong routes into the same people. Like it's, it's not an easy offense to pick up for these receivers. And the, they put a lot on the receivers plate from a mental standpoint. So if they're looking for a year one impact. They want someone who's going to be ready to do that. So it's interesting. I also think the thing about Rome that stands out to me is if correct me if I'm wrong, but I think I saw this maybe from one of your tweets or from something from pro football folks, but I think he led the college football in both deep yards and deep receptions last year. So I think a lot, and that may, and, and I may be wrong on that. So I may, may have to double check that. I, thought his, I saw look, that. his, his play style, if he didn't I'll lead it, he's, right. he's close. <laughs> so you, you saying that, I mean, the point across is going to be valid, whether he was first or whether it was like fourth right. or sixth or something like that, it's there for him. Point being, there are different ways to win as a vertical receiver than just pure speed and ball tracking. Like you yes. can win the ways you're talking about by stacking, but with route running and with winning contested catch situations. So it'll be interesting to see uh, one more before we get you out of here though. Um, in this class, I feel like it's one of the most stacked wide receiver classes I've seen. And that goes for, you know, a lot of these classes have a like let's give an example of another class that maybe okay let me try to think of how i'm going going about this sometimes in round two of a draft you can get a wide receiver one aj brown for example dk metcalf guys who fell into round two and wide receiver ones in this class do you think that there's a possibility with the giant second round pick that it can land an alpha wide receiver one type player and if that's the case would that impact your draft strategy in round one if you were the gm of the giants per se <sighs> Man, great questions. Uh, the answer, the answer to the first one is yes. I think that there are receivers who are going to be available in round two who can, you know, the term wide receiver one is so, um, I don't really know how to put this. Like pe when people think of a wide receiver one, they think of six foot two, six foot three, yeah. like, like 215, 220 pounds. And in reality, like if you have a smaller guy, who's just going to be an absolute target, like, I'm on our St. Brown's a wide receiver one at this point. Right. And right. he looks, he doesn't look anything like you would say a wide receiver one is. So True. my answer to that question has to be yes, because you've got guys like lad McConkey and Ricky Pearsall and, um, you know, maybe a Tez Walker, like maybe somebody like that, a Keon Coleman, like whatever it is, mm -hmm. you've got these guys that I think are going to be available at the top of the second round that could end up leading your team in targets. So, a team's wide receiver one, I think is different than when people hear the term wide receiver one, because like, you know, if, if you want to go towards more of a stickler for like the, the definition that you're using, I don't think Brian Thomas Jr. gets to the second round. I don't sure. think A.D. Mitchell gets to the second round. So like those would be the guys outside of those top three receivers who I would say they're built like they could be a universal wide receiver one. They have that ability to them. But there are plenty of players who can be picked on day two, who I think could be uh, develop into really, really good, good players as well. So I think the answer to that question is yes. And then shoot, does, oh, does that impact draft strategy? That is the biggest question mark that I have for so many of these teams, because yeah. this draft is really deep at quarterback. It's really deep at offensive line. It's really deep at wide receiver and it's really deep at corner. Okay. There are some defensive linemen that are really good, but I, I, I wouldn't put it on the, uh, I wouldn't put it on the same level as those positions. Those are premium positions, right? Like that, like that's what that, that's right. often what you build draft strategies around. So when you say that those positions are deep, do you tell do you tell yourself if you're the Giants, yeah, maybe we could hit on uh, I'm just throwing this out there, offensive line in the first round and then wide receiver in the second or maybe get aggressive for a quarterback in the first round and then still be able to get a wide receiver in the second. I think that there are going to be teams that convince themselves of that. And, and there's going to be, there's going to be a lot of talk of how many receivers we get in the first round. I wonder if it is a little bit less than we think it's going to be just mm. because teams think that they can wait a little bit. Right. Yeah. I, I don't, I don't know what that final Vegas over under is going to be. The top three guys are going, obviously I think Brian, again, Brian Thomas jr. And AD Mitchell, I think they're going. So there's yes. five. If you want to see the NFL letting Xavier Worthy come out, so of the if first you want to throw yeah. Xavier Worthy in there, you can. That would be six. But you know, some people are talking about like eight, nine receivers, and I don't know if we get that many. I think six probably is the magic number for me. We okay. always say there's 90 first round picks. At this yeah, season. of course, right? <laughs> it's true. If only, true. if only yeah. somebody. I think uh, Billy M, who does a lot of football stuff on Twitter, uh, he. I think he said like. This is the year that 50 players go in the first round. <laughs> and I just, I laughed. I, I just, I, I laughed because okay, it's funny. funny. And that's, uh, you know, I've got, I've got this many first round grades. And it's like, all right, well, you know, yeah. it's just, uh, it's, it's always fun. But hey, you know what? I, I never like to dampen the excitement 
Because it's always great, right? I mean, there, there's there's so much. That's why the draft is so much fun. Yes. You got so many players that you can envision helping out your football team. Man, it's just it's why I love this process. It's why I love getting to talk with guys like you, guys who who, who cover a specific team. We get into the, get into the weeds of who could fit where. Um, it just makes for a lot of fun. So I never I never harp on it too much when people you know talk about all the guys that they love as potential first round picks. Because uh, why not, man? I think yeah, that there are a lot of these guys that can break out. All right, one well, on that note, he's Trevor Sikama. He's the lead draft analyst for Pro Football Focus and the co-host of NFL Stock Exchange Pod. I highly suggest you listening to that pod if you want more draft content. You can also check out the Pro Football Focus draft guide. You can purchase that, and that has his analysis in it. So thank you so much for spending the time today, Trevor, and I hope you have a great rest of your week and great rest of your draft season. You're getting to the nitty-gritty. You got, what, another six weeks of this? Whoo, another six weeks, baby. And for everybody else out there who might go download the draft guide, we're going to be filling that thing out basically until the week before the draft. So the goal Goal is 250 players. We'd love to get up to 250 players. We'll see how the schedule plays out, but we're going to give you guys as many as we possibly can. So it was awesome being on with you guys again. I appreciate you as always for having me on. Thanks, Jeff.